Welcome everybody. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. Hello, everybody. Welcome to OSU's 2020 Constitution Day event, sponsored by the OSU Provost's Office and the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. I'm Marisa Chappelle, Associate Professor of History, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. I want to thank Erin Sneller, Natalia Bueno, Sarah Daly, and Suzanne Giftai, whose labor and expertise made this event possible. I also want to let you know that captioning is available for this event. A link will appear in your chat box. Any discussion of the US Constitution must begin by acknowledging that the nation thus constituted rests on a foundation of settler colonialism, white supremacy, and displacement and genocide of indigenous Americans. So I want to start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampanefu Band of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, Community of Oregon, and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. Constitution Day itself is not a neutral memorial. In 1940, Congress authorized the president to set aside the third Sunday in May as I am an American day a recognition and celebration of people who had attained US citizenship. In 1952, Congress replaced this with Citizenship Day to commemorate the signing of the Constitution and to instruct citizens, quote, in their responsibilities and opportunities as citizens of the United States. In 2004, Congress changed the designation to Constitution Day and Citizenship Day and required that each educational institution receiving federal funds should hold a program for students every September 17th. At OSU, we have filled this requirement with public education events that look critically at the concept of citizen, that interrogate rights, opportunities, and belonging, not as static categories, but as contested, evolving, and situational. This year, we must recognize that even for those with the most privilege in today's United States, rights, opportunities, and belonging are fragile. Unable to decide which of the overwhelming, acute, and interlocking challenges we face in 2020, we decided to center today's conversation on constitutional crises of various sorts. We are privileged to have four astute thinkers with us today. I'm gonna to introduce all four of our panelists um, at the beginning here, um, and then I'll turn it over to the panelists um, to give short presentations. And after that, we'll have time for a question and answer um, and discussion. To talk with us about democracy and electoral politics, we have Christopher Stout, Associate Professor of Political Science at OSU. Uh, Dr. Stout has published extensively on race, ethnicity, and American politics. He's the author of two books from University of Virginia Press, 
at least two books, um, Bringing Race Back In, Black Politicians, Deracialization and Voting Behavior in the Age of Obama from 2015, and the very new, The Case for Identity Politics, Polarization, Demographic Change and Racial Appeals, 2020. To talk with us about executive power, we have Rory Solberg, Associate Professor of Political Science at OSU, who's published extensively on American judicial politics. Her publications include a book with Eric Waltenberg titled The Media, The Court, and Misrepresentation, The New Myth of the Court, and that came out from Rutledge in 2014. Dr. Solberg is also editor of the journal Judicature. To talk about immigration and refugee policy, we have Dan Titchener, the Philip H. Knight Chair of Political Science and Director of the Program on Democratic Engagement and Governance of the Wayne Morse Center for Law and Politics at the University of Oregon. Dr. Titchener has published extensively on a range of issues in American politics. His most recent book with Sidney Milkus is Rivalry and Reform, Presidents, Social Movements, and the Transformation of American Politics from University of Chicago Press in 2018. He's currently working on a collaborative study, States of Immigration, which is supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And to talk about protest and the press, we have Shane Burley, a Portland-based writer and filmmaker who's published extensively in popular media from NBC News and Al Jazeera to Alternet, Truthout, Jacobin, and In These Times. He's the author of two books from AK Press, Fascism Today, What It Is and How to End It from 2017, and Why We Fight, forthcoming in 2021. Each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we will open the floor to conversation. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Stout. Thank you so much, Marisa. Let me share my screen because I have some slides I'd like to share. Um, Sorry, let me find, there we go. Is that coming through? Yes. I'm gonna assume that is, okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for organizing this. Marissa, and thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about voting and what I see as a constitutional crisis going into the year of 2020. And I guess it's important to remind us that we've had a movement toward universal suffrage over time, but it's not a linear movement, right? We've gone from a system, uh, so I guess it's important to point out that the Constitution allows states to define who are voters and who are not voters. And most states uh, had a system where only white adult property owning males or WAPM were allowed to vote, and this changed over time. We started to see a gradual disintegration of property owning, property owning being a requirement for voting starting with Kentucky in 1792 and ending with in Rhode Island in the 1840s. Uh, the 15th Amendment uh, prohibited states from barring people to vote based on their race, uh, and the 19th Amendment prohibited states from barring people to vote based on their gender, um, and the 26th Amendment allowed people 18 or older to vote. So in this process, we went from white adult property owning males, adult being adults over 21, to adults <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no. Would you be able to put it in the uh, slide format so we can see oh. your slides a little bit better? Oh, is it not in on my computer? It's in slide format. Let me try oh, it's here. showing like the, uh, your view of the slides with the next slide and the notes and everything else. Oh, funny. Uh, oh, okay. Is that better or worse? Yep, that's good. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so there's been a general movement toward more democracy, and that's what citizens want, right? If we look back at the, the start of the country, very few people would argue that it fully, was fully democracy, given how few people were allowed to vote. Uh, in a system where everyone is allowed to vote, people will have more trust in the electoral integrity of that system. But even though there has been a constant movement toward uh, universal suffrage, this, these don't come without backlashes, right? So after uh, black males were given the right to vote with the 15th Amendment. There are numerous voting disenfranchisement mechanisms like grandfather clauses, poll taxes, literacy tests, and violence against people who tried to vote, uh, which really made it so 
that the 15th Amendment was something that was good on paper, but wasn't really happening in practice. Uh, the 15th, 19th Amendment give Congress the ability to protect voting rights, and Congress did so with the 1965 Voting Rights and its extensions. But even here, we saw attacks on voting rights. Uh, numerous Southern states engaged in vote dilution to make Black votes matter less, and so they weren't able to translate their voting power into any type of representation. And so we've seen this kind of go back and forth, and this matters because how accessible voting is influences how people view the integrity of voting. And so we had seen movement going forward that had kind of been halted after the Supreme Court decision, Shelby Counter versus Holder. And what Shelby Counter versus Holder did was remove Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act, which is that of preclearance. And preclearance is important because it means any law that any state makes has to be uh, overseen by the Department of Justice to make sure that it doesn't disproportionately disenfranchise any group of voters. Without preclearance, states can make new laws and not until others can show uh, that it has a disproportionate effect on some voters can those laws be struck, struck, stricken down. Um, and so after Shelby County versus Holder, we started to see a large growth in numerous laws which uh, people see as barriers to voting, right? So voter identification laws, you've had voter purges or dro dropping voters from the rolls if they haven't voted in the last two or three elections. And you've also seen the decrease in waiting uh, in lines, or sorry, decrease in polling stations, which leads to an increase in lines. And just quickly, all of these things have an effect on turnout. Uh, Hodgnall and his colleagues found that uh, Latinos in states where you have strict photo IDs are much less likely to vote than their white counterparts. Uh, in terms of wait times, over time, we've seen an increase in the amount of time that African Americans wait. And so these people did a pretty cool study where they looked at cell phone data at polling stations to see how long you were at that polling station. And they found that, African, or that voters in districts that were mostly white waited 20% less than people who were in districts which were mostly black. In terms of voter purges, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not that actually leads to Blacks or Latinxes or others uh, being purged at a disproportionate rate. And most research has shown that that's at least early on has not been the case. But nonetheless, the point is that there's been a, a lot of creation of new laws, uh, which has led to real frustrations amongst the public. And so if voting is a constitutional right, and our constitution depends on people believing in democracy, if people have questions about the fairness of our elections, then this is certainly problematic. So that's mostly people on the left are concerned with voter fraud. Uh, on the right, I'm sorry, our voter, voter access, access to voting. People on the right, people who are tending more conservative are worried about voter fraud. So this problem or this discussion of a problem really started with it through the Heritage Foundation and um, uh, uh, someone working there named Hans von Spakovsky. And he argued that voter fraud was rampant and it was largely benefiting uh, non-citizen, not um, people who were here in the United States who weren't citizens. Uh, and so he pushed for voter ID laws as a way to eradicate this problem. Uh, Trump, of course, has claimed that the reason he didn't win the popular vote in 2016 was because of non-citizens voting in large numbers, particularly in California. He even put together a commission led by former Kansas Attorney General Chris Kobach. They weren't able to find evidence of this, but he still makes the claim that uh, a number of non-citizens have voted. This uh, claim of fraud is something that has become much more prevalent amongst conservative politicians. Uh, and Trump most recently has claimed that there's gonna be a lot of voter fraud in 2020, particularly with mail-in ballots because people will vote multiple times if they can. He's even suggested that some people vote multiple times. Uh, but the point of this is on the left, people are concerned about access and how can a democracy work if people don't have access to voting. On the right, people are concerned about whether or not elections um, can be fair, right? If they're fraudulent, if there's some evidence of fraud. And this is something that uh, polls kind of show out, uh, show. So uh, this thing here, this dark line, this light line shows voter fraud. Is this a top concern and a concern worth denying people the right to vote or make it harder for people to vote? And you can see the vast majority of individuals who identify as very conservative 
think that there should be more protection for voter fraud because they think voter fraud is a really large problem. Uh, people on the left think that this is not a problem or less of a problem. It doesn't require the same stringent um, fixes, which could lead to problems with access of voting. Uh, and this is also shown in other public opinion polls where Americans are really worried about election security and election integrity. Uh, in this particular poll carried out by Newark, um, the, only 20% of Democrats believe that votes will be counted accurately and fewer than half of Republican thinks, think that votes will be counted accurately. And the reasons are different as I pointed out. The first is Democrats worry a lot about voter suppression and Republicans worry a lot about voter fraud. So this is the second line. Two thirds of uh, Democrats say that voter suppression is a major problem and two thirds of Republicans thinks voter fraud is a major problem. And so this is something that I'd like to point out as a constitutional crisis. We can't survive as a democracy if people don't trust the outcomes of elections. Um, and while there might be no easy fix, polarization is certainly making this crisis worse. So thank you so much, and I will end here. Thank you, Chris. All right, uh, just wanna remind you, we will um, have all four of our panelists speak, and then, um, then we'll be doing questions at the end, so you can hold your questions, um, and hopefully we'll get some good conversation. I'm gonna now turn it over to Dr. Rory Solberg. Okay, Chris, you wanna stop your share? I mean, your slides are beautiful, but it might be a little confusing. I, as usual, did not put together slides because they just have a couple cases on them and I thought, no. <laughs> so um, before I begin, I'd like to thank Marisa for asking me once again to uh, join the panel for Constitution Day. This is becoming something of a tradition for at least a couple of us where we get together at the beginning of every, every year and kind of um, have some really great conversations about, uh, about the Constitution and the political context that we're in. And, and um, it's been really nice. And so I, I wanna thank her for once again inviting me. Um, I have named my remarks deja vu all over again because um, that's kind of how I feel. Um, it, it is really hard for me to believe that it's already Constitution Day um, and that it's been a whole year since the last time we got together and talked about this. And so very much has happened. And yet, in some sense, I feel like in terms of the remarks I want to make and what I want to talk about, I've been somewhat running in place as well. Um, so last year, I'll kind of do a brief look back. I took a small amount of time and I talked about the separation and balance of power between the executive and Congress and our system, you know, as was written into our constitution, the document that we celebrate today, um, and how it really has worked in reality. Um, and, and as it turns constitutional events, I'm just going to kind of continue with that theme, but put a bit more of a twist on it. Um, because when I talked about this last year, I really focused on how the court has allowed Congress to delegate it, to, to give away essentially um, a lot of power over to the executive branch. And that as long as Congress provides an intelligible principle, which is what the court requires in its legislation saying essentially we want you know, this done and we give the executive the power to do so, they can leave the details of legislation, the nitty gritty of regulation to the executive branch, to the bureaucracy. So for example, um, the Clean Air Act instructs the EPA to set ambient air quality standards, the attainment and maintenance of which in the judgment of the administrator, based on criteria and allowing an adequate margin of safety are requisite to protect the public health. That's their intelligible principle. And from this, the EPA can set 
all sorts of regulations on what can and cannot be released in the air, including how much pollution our cars and trucks can admit, how much airplanes can admit. So this system has allowed Congress to, to regulate, quite frankly, most aspects of our life without having to decide the exact nature of those regulations and leaving it to purportedly the experts over in the bureaucracy. So the bottom line of last year's comments was that Congress has given up a lot of power to the executive in terms of defining its legislation and it has limited means to control the executive once it's granted them those powers. So again, last year I noted that the court has been mostly complicit in this relationship, allowing Congress to delegate authority over to the executive, thus growing the executive at congressional expense. Again, as long as there's that intelligible principle guiding the executive in legislation. And then the court defers to the executive's power when they exert it with those delegated powers. Okay. Now, what I really wanna focus on this year, now that I've done that little wrap up, is that when we take a sort of a step back and look at it, it's not as, as, as sort of benign as you might think that there has been a trend and one that I think has been exacerbated particularly lately where the court has actually been in some senses much less deferential to Congress than it is to the executive. Where um, Congress, which if we go back to our history and we go back to the, the, the tale we tell of the United States system is supposed to be a co-equal branch of government, right? Right alongside the executive but where it's really being treated more like the ugly stepsister to the executive Cinderella at the ball. So let me back up a bit. I have somewhat established and sort of referencing last year um, that Congress can delegate this regulatory authority over to the executive branch. And this wouldn't be a big deal except for, well, the New Deal, right? To, to simplify this really, really great, um, the Great Society programs ushered in a huge expansion of the federal government, including the reach of Congress, and then subsequently the delegation of powers into those areas over to the executive branch. So using its power to tax and spend, using its power under the Commerce Clause, Congress began to regulate the economy and more. So Congress during the Civil Rights Movement um, also used the 14th and the 15th Amendments, as Chris noted, uh, to protect minorities from discrimination and to ensure access to the franchise, to the ballot. Each time Congress legislated in these areas, they would make the connection to one of their enumerated powers and then again, send the executive branch that intelligible principle to enact the regulation. Now, again, the court has generally deferred to Congress that legislation was necessary. And when a law was challenged, the rationale for that law was not suspect. For example, in 1955, when looking at a state law, the court said, it is for the legislature, not the courts, to balance the advantages and disadvantages of the new requirement. It is enough that there is an evil at hand for correction and that it might be thought that the particular legislative measure was a rational way to correct it. So that, again, that was a case dealing with a state law, but that's the precedent. That was how for many, many decades, the court looked at legislation coming from Congress. Congress says there's an evil that needs correction. This is a rational way to go about correcting it. We're good, right? So, for example, and Chris also mentioned this, uh, when the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was challenged as an intrusion on state power because it required that any state whose voter turnout based on a formula included in the legislation was less than it should have been given its demographics, that state would become, come under what was called 
federal preclearance, right? Meaning that any new voting legislation that state wanted to pass had to be approved by the United States Attorney General. So think about that for a second, because the Constitution gives the time, place, and manner of elections over to the states. That's their power. So what Congress was saying is, you know what? We're going to interfere with that power if you've triggered this formula. And then you've got to get our permission to pass your state laws. Right? So this was absolutely a large intrusion on state power. This was challenged at the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, look, there's an evil at hand. Congress has tried less extreme measures. They have not worked. Therefore, we're allowing this. South Carolina versus Katzenbach, 1966, made the Voting Rights Act, gave it the teeth it's needed, and and allow a big advance in the franchise, right? So generally speaking, again, the court over history hasn't questioned Congress or its motives. Congress was a co-equal branch, was trusted. However, that norm really seems to be changing. And we've had some examples just this year that highlight the potentially seismic shifts in the interaction between these branches of government. So for example, July just this year, the year of 2020, and all that, it, that, all that we associate with it, um, the Supreme Court issued two decisions in very seemingly similar cases, Trump v. Mazars and Trump v. Vance. Um, in these cases, you had two different requests for President Trump's financial records, and these were records from prior to becoming president. Okay, in the former case, a congressional committee was requesting the financial records of the president from various third parties, mostly banks. And in the latter case, the subpoenas were from the New York State Grand Jury that was investigating illegal financial activity within the state. For our purposes, it's the first case, the congressional subpoena, the congressional request that interests us. In a seven to two decision with Justices Thomas and Alito dissenting, the court decided that the congressional subpoena implicated serious separation of powers concerns that the lower courts didn't take into enough consideration and sent the case back down. In doing so, the court outlined four things that the lower court should look for. And the one I wanna really look at was what was number three, essentially, that the lower courts should evaluate the evidence Congress has offered to establish that a subpoena advances a valid legislative purpose. So rather than taking Congress's word for it, right, the Supreme Court was addressing the lower courts saying, you need to check out what Congress is doing and decide whether that's a valid purpose, right? So the court was not gonna take Congress's word that there was an evil anymore and that it required correction. They weren't going to take Congress's word that there was legislation that would be written and informed by this investigation. Um, the court claims that it's curbing an unlimited investigatory power grab by Congress. However, previously, the court has allowed extraordinarily vague authorizations for investigations. Um, and the court has also ruled over and over again that investigation is necessary to the legislative function. So in other words, the court would not defer to Congress. Now, this may not be that troublesome to you. After all, the Democrats were fairly giddy when they won back the House in 2018 and made it very clear that they could use investigations to dog the heels of President Trump. And the court has also made it clear over its history that investigations for the purpose of exposure are not part of that legislative function. However, we have a couple of other recent decisions um, that highlight that this lack of deference has been building over time. As I said earlier, the new, since the New Deal, Congress has used its commerce power to regulate in all sorts of ways. The Endangered Species Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Controlled Substances Act, all of these are written under the authority of the Commerce Clause. Um, 
since 1942, Congress has been able to regulate any area that would have a substantial effect on the overall of interstate commerce, on a, you know, a local activity that reverberates on interstate commerce comes under the Commerce Clause. So in the classic example, Congress could prevent a farmer from planting wheat for his own usage on his land because that would mean he'd need less wheat from the overall market, thus having an aggregate effect on interstate commerce. If Congress said it would affect commerce, the court didn't question Congress's authority until it did. In 1990, Congress passed the Gun-Free School Zone Act, which limited possession of a firearm in a school zone. Congress reasoned that guns travel in interstate commerce, and guns and crime are detrimental to schools and learning. Therefore, there should be no guns allowed near school. Again, since the New Deal, these kinds of connections were the norm, were de rigueur for Commerce Clause legislation. But this time, the Rehnquist Court said no. The connection was too remote to allow the federal government to regulate. Five years later, the court reviewed the Violence Against Women Act of 1994 in U.S. v. Morrison. Here, Congress had made several connections between violence against women and commerce, right? That violence against women keeps women from engaging in commerce. Yet the court, like in Lopez, said the law did not bear a substantial enough connection to commerce despite congressional findings. Now, you may agree with the court that Congress's power needed to be reined in, that it went too far, or that they didn't have enough of a legislative purpose in mind when requesting Trump's financial documents. But the point I am trying to make is that whether you agree with one decision or another, what the court is doing is substituting its own judgment for the judgment of Congress in these situations to determine what is and is not a valid legislative purpose and what is or is not sufficient information to support legislation, rather than looking at, as they had in the past, whether Congress has the legislative authority to regulate in that area. Finally, I'll provide you with one more example um, that is increasingly important as we approach November 2020. As Chris mentioned, in 2013, the Supreme Court heard the case of Shelby Counter v. Holder, where Shelby County, Shelby County, Alabama, uh, challenged the 2006 reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the same act that was upheld in South Carolina v. Katzenbach in 1966. When voting on the reauthorization, Congress held a lot of hearings and they assembled more than 15,000 pages of evidence that measured uh, that all the measures enacted under the Voting Rights Act were still necessary. Essentially, we still need this intervention, we still need this preclearance, we still need this triggering formula. Five of the justices, though, ruled that the record was insufficient and that the heavy burden imposed on the states by the Voting Rights Act was not responsive to current conditions. So like in Morrison, even though Congress held hearings, did fact finding, voted and passed the legislation that was then signed by the president, the court determined that the record amassed to support that legislation was insufficient. Since this decision, again, as Chris noted, states that previously would have had to have their voting laws reviewed by the federal government have been free to pass regulations regarding voter IDs. They've eliminated same day registration. They've cut back on early voting. They've placed restrictions on mail-in ballots or made higher level requirements for accepting those ballots. They've had proof of citizenship required for registration. And some states have even required um, dual registration systems where you have to register once for the federal elections and once for the state elections. So a lot of people are gonna find that they can't vote in one or the other in those states because they didn't realize they had to register twice. So what does it mean when the court stops deferring to Congress or stops trusting Congress to know its job or stops taking Congress at its word? Well, 
sometimes you're going to like those results. If the decision cuts against a program or a law that you dislike, you'll be like, fine, no problem. But other times you'll be incensed because if it's a policy that you liked, if it's a policy you wanted, if you like that administration, you're going to be pissed off that the Supreme Court shut it down. But more importantly, how do you have a system of shared powers and responsibilities if one branch, the presidency, keeps gaining power at the expense of another branch, Congress? And when that branch of, of government, Congress, cries foul, the court, court you know, simply treats that co-equal partner as the boy who cried wolf. You get a continual disintegration of the careful system of checks and balances created by the framers, especially when the court is not treating the president with the same disdain as we saw again in 2018 in Trump v. Hawaii, where the court said, um, when the executive exercises this delegated power negatively on the basis of a facially legitimate and bona fide reason, the court will neither look behind the exercise of that discretion nor test it by balancing its justification. In other words, despite the vast record that, set, that uh, existed of Trump saying, I'm gonna pass this immigration ban to make sure more Muslims don't enter our nation, the court said, look, his, his order is neutral in place and he's got a reason that isn't related to religion to pass it, so we're not gonna question it. So that deference they used to show Congress, they still show the executive. And so we're getting to this point where things are tipping very heavily in one favor and there's no way to rebalance. And I'll just leave it there. Thank On you. On that happy, Rory. happy note. <laughs> Thanks, Rory. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Dan Titchener. Thanks. Um, it's great to join you for your Citizenship and Constitution Day. And um, so my charge is to focus on immigration, um, but I'd like to begin with a broader observation. Um, among the pressing developments that the organizers for today asked us to think about, two in particular stood out for me. Um, the first is the mass mobilization against white supremacy and racial injustice uh, following George Floyd's murder this summer. And the second are the profound threats to democratic norms and processes. So, so here's my larger observation. Um, the United States is at once an old and a new democracy. Ours is the oldest um, constitutional regime in the world, one in which governing power at least is theoretically based on electoral accountability and representation. Yet, at the same time, aspirations expressed in that other founding document, the Declaration of Independence, um, uh, you know, aspirations such as equality and political rights have been unfulfilled for many Americans for more than two centuries. For example, the halting extension of basic political rights through the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts did not come until the 1960s. Um, the history of immigrants in this country captures these exclusionary traditions, I think, um, all too well. Among the foreign born, for instance, uh, U.S. naturalization law from 1790 to 1952 limited um, access to citizenship among the foreign born to so-called free whites. This meant that immigrants of color from Asia, Latin America, and other non-European source countries were denied access to citizenship from the founding until 1950s. And our history abounds with other examples of anti-democratic traditions, of structures of white supremacy shaping our response to immigrants and refugees. Um, so for instance, Chinese exclusion. So we. Um, it, it, we can circle back to the naturalization law, denying to Chinese newcomers from you know, the time they arrived in the 1840s until 1952, the opportunity to, um, to become naturalized and gain full membership. Um, another example would be the eugenics inspired uh, national origins quotas, which um, were begun in the 1920s kind of the, the first, during another uh, crisis moment, uh, uh, an earlier pandemic um, in 1918, our country was just beginning to implement um, a literacy test um, meant to screen out all but Northern and Western Europeans who were considered by policymakers in both parties to be the superior immigrant group to bring to the country. Um, and 
In fact, um, their, their theory was, again, relying on eugenics and a notion of innate superiority of certain groups, was that Southern Eastern Europeans, um, my people, we came from Hungary, um, uh, you know, were cast as darker, swarthier, less trustworthy, more dangerous in terms of public health, um, more prone to crime. Sound familiar? Um, and so the thought was that the literacy test um, by, because of IQ issues would more uh, naturally favor Northern and Western Europeans. Well, as it turned out, it didn't work out that way. Southern and Eastern Europeans passed the literacy test at much higher rates. And so social scientists um, at the time might have concluded that um, their assumptions in terms of um, the superiority of certain racial and ethnic and religious groups was wrong. But no, um, their conclusion was that in fact, immigrants from Italy and um, Poland and elsewhere were getting cheat sheets from, from their governments to pass the test. So all that is a long background to the creation of a national origins quota system um, in which um, uh, in federal law, we explicitly created um, uh, uh, special quotas that favored um, Northern and Western European immigrants. So, you know, English, Irish, Swedes, Germans, and so forth, and discriminated against all other European immigrants and circling back to Chinese exclusion, even more drastically established something called an Asiatic Bard Zone, um, which excluded almost all other immigrants, um, especially immigrants of color from outside the Western Hemisphere. Which takes us to a third example of these anti-democratic traditions and structures of white supremacy in our immigration law um, in our history, which is that Mexican migrants were welcomed into the country in key points um, uh, from the 1920s onward to um, you know, work the fields, to harvest, to do, to basically provide an exploitable labor force. Um, but that also um, uh, was interspersed with mass deportations and in the 1930s and the 1950s and other periods. And to give you some example of that, um, in 1954, under Eisenhower's administration, um, the racist term that was coined by the INS at the time was Operation Wetback, um, was launched, which removed um, uh, huge numbers of, of Mexican and Mexican-American um, residents in the U.S. Um, uh, as you know, kind of a massive crackdown at the time. So again, the United States, uh, both an old and a very new democracy in, in, in key ways. Um, so in my remaining time, what I'd like to do is highlight some of the perils of congressional inaction and executive unilateralism in immigration policy in recent decades. So comprehensive immigration reform has in the United States has been like waiting for Godot um, uh, in, during the past you know, several decades. Congress has been unable to pass any kind of major legislation on this issue for decades. Um, and this is very much the result of another key democratic challenge, which is hyperpartisan polarization. Um, I should just add quickly that major immigration reform almost always requires bipartisan compromise and majority coalitions involving strange bedfellows. You can think of Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, a lion of the left from Massachusetts, and Alan Simpson, Republican from Wyoming, were key in, in certain reforms. Um, and what has made major reform exceptionally elusive um, in, you know, during the past quarter century is just how divided Congress is along partisan lines on immigration reform. So again, just to reiterate, whenever we've had comprehensive reform in the past, it's required bipartisan coalitions, negotiating, working together in Congress. Um, and, um, uh, in, in the contemporary period, what we have instead is, you know, this polarization of the parties, particularly on immigration, just as in many other issues. And so this has meant, especially during periods of divided party government, that Congress is paralyzed in terms of major policy innovation. So the absence of major legislative reform um, in our immigration system has had two key, um, key, two key implications. Um, so one is that in the, in the absence of congressional action, states and local jurisdictions have often entered the void as significant policymakers. 
And the result of this has, to create, has been to create a patch quilt of different kinds of policies for immigrants and their families. And so on, on one side, you have sanctuary cities and inclusive states like California, where in-state tuition, access to driver's cars, and sanctuary policies exist. But so too do we have in various local jurisdictions and states very draconian restrictive policies. And so for instance, in Arizona, you had um, infamously SB 1070, the show me your papers law, um, uh, and a variety of other significant restrictions um, on immigrants. Um, but a second implication of congressional inaction has been extraordinary presidential unilateralism. That is, enormous discretion um, and, and free reign for the executive branch to act in the absence of Congress. And like the states, this kind of unilateral executive action can cut in two directions. For instance, under President Obama, um, who, by the way, started um, in his administration with a very vigorous um, deportation policy. He was trying to show his bona fides um, to get broader immigration reform. So he was trying to reassure conservatives that he could be enforcing the law while also being more generous in other areas of immigration policy. Well, um, for this, he gained, gained the moniker of deporter in chief um, from immigrant rights advocates. But what's really striking is something that occurs during the tail end of his first administration. It's in that period that dreamer movement activists press the administration. Older immigration rights activists encourage their younger counterparts to be patient, but not unlike um, the Students for non, uh, um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, during the Civil Rights Movement and other young African-American activists challenging their, their elders, um, they actually press the case against Obama, taking to the streets, engaging in demonstrations, hunger strikes, and during the 2012 election, um, we're working to, uh, with Republicans um, to potentially pass dreamer legislation. And in that context of movement pressure, um, ultimately the Obama administration relented and um, resulted in um, the important executive action of deferred action for childhood arrivals or what we now call in shorthand DACA. Um, so kind of a dramatic example of executive unilateral action. And then with DACA and then later with something called DAPA, which was aimed at parents that the courts ultimately stop, you could see the Obama administration using its independent uh, um, action in this area to try to be more expansive in certain ways. And of course, during the Trump administration, we've seen sweeping restrictions on immigration and refugee um, uh, rights and um, admissions opportunities almost in every category. And in fact, during the crisis of this coronavirus threat, um, that actually has been, been used by Stephen Miller and others within the administration who um, have favored immigration restriction from the start to press um, vociferously for you know, just broad restriction um, where one can. Now, the courts have played some role in limiting um, executive action in certain ways. So I mentioned DAPA um, uh, under Obama, and in fact, the, a divided Supreme Court, um, this was after uh, Justice Scalia had died, um, was deadlocked 4-4, which left in place an injunction by a lower court that basically spelled the death knell for DAPA. Under Trump, um, uh, DACA was rescinded early on, um, but just this past June, uh, the Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, Roberts wrote the opinion, decided 5-4 that in fact, um, that was an arbitrary and capricious decision um, because of the reliance implications on uh, dreamers who had signed on to DACA. Um, but in truth, executive action is often unrestrained in this policy area as we know all, know all too well. And I don't wanna take up much more time, but I'll simply say quickly that we need only look at something like the family separation policy Think, remember, uh, you can recall the child, children in cages and so forth, which explicitly was sold as a deterrent um, to um, uh, migrants at the US border. 
Moreover, our enforcement agencies have had broader discretion um, and we've had a lot of revelations and stories recently about um, ICE detention practices um, um, that have been extraordinarily um, um, troublesome. So let me just end with one last point that I'd like to highlight, which is the role of movement activists in challenging the status quo. I mentioned a moment ago about DREAMers and DACA, and what's really striking is the extent to which um, Obama initially resisted and resented the criticism of young DREAMers, but by the time we got into his second administration, he was often encouraging them to, as he said, go make me do it, hit the streets, force me to act. Um, the Muslim ban under um, uh, President Trump is an example of, you know, kind of significant um, movement resistance. Um, and of course, um, we've also seen nativist mobilizations at the grassroots um, that has deeply informed the Republican base. So let me just close by saying that this movement activity, the significant role of insurgents um, uh, in tandem with elected officials um, in our democratic process reminds us that change doesn't simply come from above or simply from below, but often reflects a, a very compelling combination of both. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Titchener. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to our um, to our sorry final panelist, Shane Burley. Hey, thank you so much, and I want to thank uh, all the panelists for. You know, inviting me and, and sharing this, letting me be a part of it. Um, I, I have a sort of a, a, a different direction I'm going to go with this, and I'm going to kind of shrink things down a little bit and talk about something that's kind of happening here um, where I am in Portland, Oregon, and that's uh, kind of been defining the state over the last uh, few months. Um, we're hitting over 110 days of protest here in Portland against police violence in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. And I, I thought I would kind of start with a little bit of how I've been covering these protests as I go out several nights a week, writing for different publications and stuff. First off, every day, I, before I head out, I put on a bulletproof vest and I put on a bulletproof helmet. This is a AAA rated helmet that you would normally see on someone who was embedded in Iraq or Afghanistan. It's generally the same equipment as what I wear. I wear ballistic uh, goggles that are able to stop um, uh, impact munition uh, on contact. Um, and also a full gas mask. That way I can stay in there during the dispersals when they uh, blanket the area with tear gas. Um, I should say that I've, I've covered stuff for many, many years and I've covered stuff in, in all kinds of different uh, situations. And this is unique. This is not a normal situation. And it's not one that's coming from all sides. It's one that's coming particularly from the way that police are handling both protesters and the press. And it's one that's bore out its uh, reasonableness um, as we've seen these kind of attacks on the press and, report, and press and journalists and legal observers continue. So, over the last, since basically the killing of George Floyd on May 25th and the protest that started two days later, um, the Press Freedom Tracker has tracked 813 attacks on the press, which is totally unprecedented. These are numbers that are totally off the charts at this point. Portland leads that uh, with 229. That's more than double the next place, which is Minneapolis, where the protests actually began and where some of the first allegations of uh, attacks on the press were so severe. Um, here in Portland, it's totally led the pack. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens. So we have kind of a sense of what the chronology here is, and then a little bit about what some of the concerns are that are going to be raised here as Portland's acting sort of as the vanguard for the rest of the country. So obviously the protest started here a couple days later on May 29th, and there was these big actions that kind of started to swell as the days went on. You know, 500 people became 1,000 people, became 5,000 people, became 10, and as upwards of 15, 16,000 at its absolute peak. Um, so for Portland and mid-sized cities, these are really, really significant numbers. And the Portland police responded in kind very, very aggressively right from the beginning. And so there was a number of legacy reporters that were hit, either brought in on what they call these big kettling sweeps, which is bringing big crowds of people together um, for arrest. They're attacked, hit with batons, or of course with tear gas and impact munition. I think people maybe don't understand the significance of what an impact munition are. These are what they call less lethal munitions that are used on protesters to help try and disperse them. But these are incredibly violent and have led to really, really serious injuries all across Portland. Several people with traumatic brain injuries, people that were sent into um, seizures, and a lot of people facing really long-term injuries from them, including reporters. 
This led to a, a series of lawsuits from the ACLU and the National Lawyers Guild to try and uh, tamp back the effect both on specifically the press, but then just the use of these impact munitions and tear gas in general, which were uh, damaging so many people and also just the residents of the city where the protests were being held. Um, so there was some injunctions put in place, particularly on tear gas and on the press. And so things started to kind of shrink back and the protests had actually started to decline. And that's when Trump uh, put in his uh, um, uh, executive order uh, to quote unquote protect federal monuments and the federal officers came in, which was a confederation of border patrol and other agencies um, that basically were an extra militized police force to deal with the protesters. Um, that's when we started to see kind of an excessive um, uh, upturn of this attack, particularly on reporters in the press. Um, these were the snatch and grab videos that upset so many people. And this helped to bring people back out to the streets. And that actually swelled the protests back into the thousands. Um, and then, obviously, uh, there was an outrage about this. The Democratic leadership of the state and negotiated with the, the White House and had these officers pulled back. And the deal that they made was essentially that Oregon State Police and Portland Police would be able to handle it. They could basically fill this role. You don't need to have that. And I think the outrage that had kind of coalesced around both the political establishment in the state and kind of rest of the, of the kind of civil establishment started to decline. Trump's uh, in basically intervention into the city was unwanted and felt like an overreach and therefore the police themselves were actually discussed as an occupation and they had to be kind of rejected and pushed out. But when the Portland police and Oregon State Police returned, the violence did not stop. And in fact, in some cases, the violence on the press in particular only ramped up. And this was more instances of press either being attacked or being arrested and overcharged. And so I wanted to talk just really quickly about a couple of things that are happening here that are unique and are showing kind of their effects across the country as other reporters in other cities are facing kind of similar things. So one is the limitation on access. People aren't getting access to the police, they're not getting access to clear records, they're not getting access to questions answered, and they're not getting access to space. Generally, reporters are allowed access to space so they can do their work, particularly during a, a, a complicated conflict like the protests. That's not happening. And in fact, there's a black wall around all kind of press communication that's happening. And the only communication that does happen happens through a, a very limited press office. This is incredibly unusual. They're forcing universal disbursement. This is something that, that might sound like kind of a wonky uh, term, but it's actually really important when understanding how these protests are covered. When a protest is happening and they're trying to disperse people, rightly or wrongly, I think that's debatable, but generally the press are considered outside of that. They're a neutral observer, even if they're with maybe a politically loaded publication or they have views their own, they are still considered an important part of this process. Instead, the police have ordered universal dispersals, meaning that the press have to follow the same rules, have to basically run from them as they shoot uh, impact munitions into the crowd, and that no allowances are going to be given for that. The same is true of legal observers. These are volunteers who basically document things for organizations like the ACLU. Um, they are defining out journalists. And this is something that I think uh, has been really difficult to communicate in a lot of publications about what this exactly means. But what there is is a debate about what qualifies as a journalist. So when I'm down there covering things, you'll see a lot of legacy reporters, people from the TV stations, New York Times, uh, The New Yorker, they're all down there reporting. But that's not the majority of the people reporting. The majority of the people reporting are often young people reporting on social media, they're live streaming, they're taking videos, they're writing up for blogs, and that is the video, and those are the photos that go into nationwide press. The budgets, a lot of these TV channels and publications have shrunk, they do not have reporters to keep in the field 12 hours a night um, every day. And so these folks are actually documenting what we know about the protests. Those are the same people that the Portland police and the Oregon State Police and the federal officers argued should not be considered press and should not be given press allowances. And they make lots of public pronouncements, um, basically pushing conspiracy theories that these were actually protesters just dressed in press garb and that kind of thing, trying to somehow be, uh, you know, immune to the rules. This has created a really big crisis about what is considered a journalist and what is not. And by drawing that line, people actually limit the access to journalism by defining out citizen journalism, which is historically an incredibly important piece of the larger journalism puzzle. The other thing is to target them intentionally. Now, this is something that the, the, the 
police officials in the press office have, have fought really, really vigorously, and it makes sense why they would push back on this. But generally, most of the reporters who have been arrested have brought back stories about being targeted very intentionally for their press work. So I did a story recently where I interviewed a number of reporters who had had their tires slashed. And oftentimes, when people do dispersals, reporters will go to their car to leave the area. And there's been several times when, report, when the police will come up, break out their windows with batons, and then slash all of their tires. Now, they're very clearly labeled as press. They put it on their car, they put it on their uh, bulletproof vests or what we call flap jackets, uh, and they're wearing press passes. And so it's very, there's, there's really no ambiguity about it, but they still end up feeling targeted. And what they're often reporting is that when they're able to identify an officer, when they're photographing officers specifically, that's all of a sudden when excessive force is being used against them. And this is the argument that the National Lawyers Guild and the ACLU have made. The additionally with that is overcharging them. Um, there was a young reporter, Corey Elias, who basically was charged with assaulting an officer. They eventually had to drop some of those charges because the video showed him doing nothing other than being arrested as part of a large kettle. But the question was ended up being, why are these sorts of charges being spewed out to folks that are clearly at work at that moment as a reporter just doing their kind of regular documentation? And this has had a real far-reaching effect. It makes uh, newsrooms less likely to send reporters in because of the danger that ends up going for those their staff and for their, their legal immunity. Um, and it ends up making a lot of the younger kind of citizen journalist types less likely to be there. Um, and that is a really essential piece, like I said, about capturing this information. So this is something that's happening all across the way. There's reporters being arrested in New York City as uh, New York City basically runs roughshod over protesters. In Minneapolis, um, there's really famous cases of CNN and NBC reporters being hit and struck by uh, police. Um, all across the country right now, there is an aggressive policing response to these protests, and the reporters are being swept up in that as one kind of common assailant into this crowd. Now, I want to acknowledge that there's a, a problematic element to this discussion. I'm talking about reporters as if they are this special class of people that they're separated from the rest of the public. And it's important not to do that. Um, the things that reporters are facing or that, sh that they shouldn't be facing, I should say, also average people who want to exercise their First Amendment right and show discontent with the police, they should be safe as well. But I think it's important to note that the Reporters are often still given a privileged role and the attacks on them are sort of a canary in the coal mine about how the police are going to be treating sort of this First Amendment rights in the large crowds of people. As these protests are continuing, there is a dynamic that's forming with the police that's sort of a battle for their existential future. Each night, the protesters go out and they demand not just that the police stop their violence, not just that the police pull back, but that they're defunded and in some cases totally abolished. And on the flip side, the police, often speaking through the police union, are arguing for their very survival and in a lot of ways expansion. These are two sides that are sort of fighting it out, and there's no reason at this point to believe that that is going to start to decline in the next couple of weeks. This is a very serious political issue. And within that, the reporters document it are often seen as a component of the protesters rather than a neutral observer. And the documentation of the police excessive use of force during the protests has essentially kept the protests going over the last couple of months. I think I'm just going to wrap it up a little bit because I think we can bring a lot of this discussion or we can bring a lot of this into the discussion in Q&A. But there's an important element of creep that happens here with the, the way that police are using the standard. If they allow these standards, to, if we allow these standards to stand unchecked and unchallenged, they become the new status quo and a precedent is set. Um, I, you know, I've interviewed, had to interview um, uh, leadership at the ACLU, Oregon ACLU and, and National Lawyers School a lot when covering these stories. And one thing that the person from the National Lawyers School said that stuck with me is that the general policy of police in these situations is to act on impulse and ask for um, forgiveness afterwards. And so this is to basically take further steps that might be considered socially unacceptable, for example, pushing at, at uh, reporters, arresting reporters, using um, unreasonable force, that kind of thing, and then having to deal with the consequences later and hopefully that they can justify the use of force after the fact. This is the point at which 
uh, these sorts of things become standard and these sorts of things become accepted and considered reasonable. And we've accepted lots of these, these kind of creeps over the years. We accepted uh, creeps into civil liberties after 9-11. We've accepted them since Trump has come into office, these have become the status quo. And it requires an actual response that people do not want the police treatment of the press and report and, and uh, protesters to become the new status quo. And so we often talk about things like the First Amendment, or kind of legal protections that we have as these fixed, neutral, um, uh, dependable documents. But in reality, these are malleable uh, words on a page that are basically depend on who enforces them and who forces their hand on that. And so the mass of people and the reporters that are reporting on it need to have a voice in that and be willing to kind of stand up and push back on the creep that's uh, coming from the police on their First Amendment rights. I'll go ahead and pass it off to uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, Shane. So um, here's how q and is going to work. Um, we have a good bit of time to uh, have a conversation. If you have a question, um, please type it into the Q&A um, feature. And if you do that with your name, then I can call on you and you can actually ask your question verbally. If you do it anonymously, um, then uh, if we have time, I can ask that question. So um, I want to start, I see a question from uh, Steve, and I'm going to uh, allow you to ask that, Steve. Go ahead. Took me a second to get to the key. Um, from all of your presentations, it's clear that the road to liberty has not been a consistent march towards equality. Uh, each of you has discussed executive actions, for example. How has the executive branch arguing that the preservation of liberty relies on suppression fared when periods were examined later and if those actions were required? And I'm thinking of the Alien and Sedition Acts during the Adams administration, uh, the Sedition Act of 1918 under the Wilson administration, and then just recently the Attorney General's recent comments about sedition. And um, I understand that, you know, the the history is one aspect, but the other one is is just being kind of present in our moment as well and thinking about how the actions that have um, permeated our, our our streets and our nation over the uh, past few months fit into that larger narrative of American history. Uh, thank you for answering. Thanks, Steve. I see uh, Dr. Titchener. Oh, yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, so I I'll take a first crack at this and and. Um, I think it's a great question, and what strikes me is there's a significant difference about whether retrospectively and at the time um, of this kind of suppression of certain liberties, whether the executive is doing so that's in, in a way that's targeted for a certain group, or whether it's perceived as affecting broad portions of the population. So let me give a few examples. During World War I, for example, um, there... Um, after the fact, it became super clear that um, uh, many Americans were, were incensed by the level of media censorship that took place during World War I, something that affected many people. However, um, you know, significant constrictions on civil liberties for Germans during the war was not something that many Americans had much trouble with. Or you can fast forward and, and the behavioralists on this panel can, can say when they want to start trusting public opinion polls, but we have public opinion polling surrounding Japanese internment. And, you know, most Americans, you can see certain Gallup polls during um, World War II, and when they're asked about things about like, you know, fingerprinting all Americans, certain kinds of identification and so forth, adamantly opposed to it. Asked about Japanese internment, no problem, okay? Fast forward to 9-11, the immediate aftermath of that, um, and what occurred during the Bush administration with surveillance, most Americans to this day were deeply, deeply opposed mass surveillance using our cell phones and other things. Um, and yet, um, when asked specifically with clear evidence of the surveillance of, um, of mosques and Muslim Americans writ large, so profiling on a massive scale, most Americans said no problem. So I think it depends enormously in terms of that executive action, prerogative presidential power, emergency power and response um, uh, to perceived crises and limits on civil liberties about whether it's targeted, particularly if it's targeted at a group that's, um, that's um, particularly vulnerable or unpopular at the time, or whether it's something that affects all of us. So that's my, my crack at it. 
Anyone else wanna respond? If I can figure out how to unmute. Um, I'll, I'll uh, throw it back and, and sort of uh, give Steve and, and Marisa their due and say that um, I think that, that Dan is absolutely right. At the time, people don't have a lot of problem with it if you do public opinion polls. But the historical lens that we end up looking back with when we look at the Alien and Sedition Act, right? Adams does not come out looking like, uh, you know, smelling like a bed of roses um, for, for his presidency or, or that. When we look back, um, you know, we just had Chief Justice Roberts in one of those cases that I talked about, um, you know, essentially vilifying the decision in Korematsu and saying it does not stand in the court of history. Right? When we look at the Alien and Sedition Act and how it was applied in the first and the second Red Scares, history shows us that these were huge impositions on our basic civil rights and liberties. And these, these eras do not fare well historically. But that's the 2020 hindsight perspective that doesn't mean that at the time there, there isn't um, massive restrictions on civil liberties that can have big implications later. And I kind of want to tie Steve's question into some of what Shane was saying there at the end. Um, part of the problem is that in this country, we tend to look to the courts to save everything. We look to the courts to interpret the Constitution in a way that will protect our rights. That shows a lack of historical knowledge to know that the courts actually aren't often on the side of minorities. They are, you know, everyone thinks Brown versus Board of Ed, that's what the court does. And that's not really, the court is more often with public opinion and with um, the, the, the administrations. But also, um, and this comes from a, a, a scholar from Princeton, and I think it's just a brilliant thing where he talks about not just constitutional interpretation, but constitutional constructions, that the political context of the time can create new meaning for the Constitution. So as the president says, you know, we don't really need free press because it's all fake news, right? And as that support in general permeates or the lack of support permeates or his interpretation of what presidential power is or et cetera, as that continues over time, you'll get a new construction that will bleed into constitutional interpretation. Um, and so it does matter what we think. It does matter how we look at it. And if we have years and year, you know, years or decades of executive growing and this becomes the new normal, right? That's going to infect or affect, not infect, but affect the interpretations that come from right? The courts are not immune to historical precedent. They're not immune to the political context. So that's all I just wanted to say. Thanks. Um, I have a question here. I, I will ask it because it's anonymous. Um, what are the linkages between moments of crisis and the changes that have come later? Are there best examples of opening up or closing voting rights, executive power, congressional oversight, immigration changes in the wake of a crisis? Um, it's a great question. I saw that question earlier and I've been trying to think of best examples and really the only one I can sort of come up with in terms of limiting executive power is Watergate, right? But again, going back to that idea of the constitutional construction, it wasn't that we changed the constitution. It wasn't necessarily, I mean, we did institute some laws after Watergate. There goes my child's things in the Big Bang. Um, but really what it was, was, you know, when Carter came in and sort of took a different perspective on the constitution. And I think you kind of saw the same thing with Obama, not that he wasn't as powerful of a presidency, but he didn't push it in the same way, didn't push executive power quite in the same way. Um, and so it's the people who are in the offices who are constructing the constitution rather than necessarily the interpretation is, is, is my limited answer to that. 
I have an answer too, but I've been, I just chatted. So I don't know if, if Shane or Christopher, you want to jump in first? I, I just briefly, I'll say, uh, thinking about, if you don't mind, Dan, if that's okay. Uh, just the opposite of that, you know, the closing up, the other part of the question was opening up on voting rights and things like this. Uh, I think that this often does happen in periods of crises, um, but in part, it's the crises mixed with people coming on to the streets, right? So the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, those things wouldn't have happened uh, if not for protesters going out and changing public opinion. So people are viewing things, as Shane discussed in Portland, that shifts public opinion, and then government is much more interested in getting something done. Yeah, that, that was essentially what I was gonna to say was that like people look at these moments and think about the crisis, but a crisis usually coincides with a, a mass mobilization of people. Social movements are a form of crisis because they destabilize certain comforts, uh, sometimes really severely um, as a way of kind of branching that open. So on the one hand, we have a crisis might open up uh, either public opinion or you know, even like technocratic thought on a particular issue about how something might be changed, but also that crisis happens simultaneously with the crisis of people and mass participation. So I think sometimes it's not where we have to look at it. It's not always the history of the crisis, but it might be the history of people's participation in that crisis. I would just add it's, that that's also, what's also significant is how reformers and activists try to mobilize and retrofit their arguments around a crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I think it cuts in both ways. So picking up what, what Christopher was saying on a more expansive, expansive um, side of this, um, you know, we have a lot of work on the Cold War and, and civil rights expansion. So like Mary Duziak's Cold War Civil Rights and, um, is a good example of this. Um, but clearly it can go um, in, in retrograde fashion as well. And so for instance, um, you know, circling back to uh, the 19 teens, you know, the first world war then followed immediately with the Spanish flu pandemic. You had immigration restrictionist nativists who for years had been trying to press the national origins quotas approach that I mentioned earlier. And once you had um, the, the national security jitters and then the the public health scare, and then later the first red scare, they retrofitted their arguments for why you had to have national origins quotas around that. Um, and likewise, 9-11 would be an example of immigration restrictionists really pouncing on that issue as a way to justify um, not um, you know, pushing through some um, new form of legalization. So you know, I think, I think the, the reformers, the activists, um, play a significant role in how they frame their issues around a crisis and it can go both directions. Yeah, I think that and that the, the um, pointing to the Cold War and civil rights really highlights the how complicated it is, right? So the crisis of the Cold War opened up certain space for certain kinds of advancements around civil rights and also shut down other kinds of opportunities, right? All right, um, another question here. Um, the talks prompt us to consider how interpretations of the Constitution change over time and how the Constitution itself has changed through amendments for sure, but also through the sense of crisis and urgency itself. Um, I suppose the last presentation makes clear that there's an important role of and for a press in terms of covering politics and informing the public, but even more broadly in making claims regarding free speech and freedom of assembly. Could each of you speak to the changing views of the Constitution amendments and role of journalists as an indicator of free speech practices? Maybe we'll hit up Shane first here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to answer this. So there, there's the, what we're specifically talking about here, press access to institutions of power, police violence or state power. Um, and that obviously shifts over time and we see dramatic reductions after 9-11, we see expansions in certain spaces. I think what's important to note is that it changes one very, very rapidly. Um, and so, for example, the, the discussion we had around the press 
and covering particularly police violence was different in the middle of May than it is in the middle of July than it is actually right now. And that, that, that kind of public opinion, but also the legal opinion that kind of trails from that has shifted around that. Right now, we're actually in a very sticky place talking about the concept of free speech and what that actually means. Um, and, you know, that's kind of been a, a political volley both on the left and the right, and the, the right seems to kind of own that issue right now, particularly about things like campus, political protests, no platform, and things like that. But I think what we need to do is take a, a step back and kind of think about this in more simple terms. Are the press allowed to do their job? Do they have a specific function in society? Is that function allowed to play out? And that's maybe more important than the abstractions of free speech and what that means. Um, we understand that generally to mean uh, state intervention in the speech, but not you know, mutual access to speech. And so I think it's important to think about what the role of the press is and to crystallize the access around that rather than kind of trying to harmonize just what free speech means because that's gonna change in constituency and it's generally been a kind of political mobilization, not one that I think is always that clearly defined. Anyone else wanna weigh in on that one? Okay. Um, there's a question from Adrian. I'm going to uh, allow you to talk there, Adrian, and ask your question, if that's all right. You should be good to go. OK, thank you. Uh, so as civil rights history has shown, any large push for advancements of rights always has some sneaky reciprocal snapback of rights as well. So assuming that the current movement for Black Lives has some positive advancements, how do we watch the inevitable suppression of rights that has occurred time and time again in history. Thank you. I, I could jump in. I, I, I just talked last though. Somebody else wants to go first. Um, you know, I think we're talking a lot about legal frameworks, but I think it's important to look at the extrajudicial frameworks and how extrajudicial violence maintains certain kinds of social order. So uh, obviously we are talking about, I was talking about um, reporting on the protests against police violence, but there was another type of protest that has happened over the last three months uh, where far right wing groups come into cities, um, sometimes stage violent attacks on people. And what happened on August 22nd in Portland, there was a, a, a large rally, three or 400 people called it Back the Blue Rally, and it was a number of far right organizations. And it was the one day in this entire window when the police stayed three blocks away, refused to intervene. And so there was a question of the violence that police are accused of, you know, say we killing George Floyd or, or, or killing or, or attacks in, in um, communities of color. And there's also the violence that hasn't been intervened on and the violence that isn't being stopped. And I think what we should talk about when we're talking about the kind of attack on rights is also what kind of happens in the social sphere and happens both outside the state or with certain amount of state complicity. And I think that's something people should be very, very concerned in is that when there is like a left social movement, an anti-racist or anti-oppression social movement, there is a reactionary backlash from certain privileged sectors. And that can actually result in a lot of social control that happens outside of the parameters of the state. All right, I'll jump in. Um... I think there's a, there's a couple of things that come to mind, and, and I have to say y'all are asking really well thought out, really hard questions this year. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, um, one of the things that, you know, to, to sort of tie in with Shane is that the, the rights that we, you know, and, and the, the rights that we have and the advancements that may or may not be made those are all you know, up here on paper and you've got the street level bureaucrats that are gonna have to make the decisions about when things apply and when things don't apply, right? And that's one of the places where you have to look for that sort of, as you put it, what was it? Uh, sneaky backlash or sneaky suppression, right? So how, you know, what is the differential, imp differential treatment or differ differential impact of, of, of a right, right? Yes. Um, you know, we'll, we'll advance or, or we'll change the rules about what police can do and it will be applied, you know, one way in Portland and a very different way in Des Moines, for example, even though the rule is the same, right? Um, the other thing, um, I'm going to forget what my other thing was. <laughs> I probably did. But the other point is that, you know, again, these are, these are rights that are on paper and 
for the, you know, uh, oftentimes the conflict and whether these rights and these, this progression is moving forward or not will get sorted out in court. And the courts are always balancing, right? Regardless of how important the right is, they're always balancing the needs of the state as well. And there will always be some deference by a governmental institution for what they perceive as the needs of the state to protect public safety, to keep law and order, right? So regardless of advancement, there will be that, that balancing that occurs. Um, and, you know, and, and some equal weight given to both of those. Uh, and that's why I think when you hear about the, the narratives or you hear the stories as they happen in the press, and then you read sort of a court case about it later on, it is so sterilized in some senses because of how the courts operate and what they see um, and how they provide that space for the state's argument as well, um, that it can be a bit disconcerting. I think I would just um, quickly add too that, it, and I think this is probably um, uh, implicit in your question, but I just wanna make sure it's, it's overt, um, is the extent to which democratizing and reactionary movements have become incorporated and, and front and center in both parties. So in a sense, you know, the, work by Sid Taro and others, are, newer work by them is emphasizing, you know, the significance of movement parties in the United States. So I, you know, several of us have talked about the polarization that we're seeing and, and you know, the hyperpolarization and its impact on our politics, um, but what stands out. So for instance, um, you have the civil rights movement and, and, um, and, and its significance, um, not just in policy, but for the Democratic Party and what changes in its rank and file and we go from the Freedom Democratic Party struggles to significant inroads um, for many of those activists years later. On the flip side, the New Christian Right, you know, uh, a lot of the terrific um, new work that's come out about the New Christian Right um, in recent years highlights the extent to which th the origins of that movement um, were, were not, as Jerry Falwell claimed, a, a reaction to Roe v. Wade, which happened you know, in the early 70s and had nothing to do with its early mobilization. All of the early mobilization um, was really significantly in response to school desegregation and what that was that meant for so-called segregation academies that a number of these fundamentalist school uh, uh, churches ran, as well as a reaction to the, the, the Equal Rights Amendment. And so, you know, the Christian right becoming a key anchor group for the Republican Party dramatically impact. So I, I think we're almost seeing in real time, and Shane was referring to this, where you can see, you know, both kinds of movement activities at once. So, you know, in April, May, we have um, armed, ar armed anti-maskers showing up in the Michigan State House um, with the president, who's a movement president, not just, you know, atop a movement party, you know, saying, liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia. And then um, uh, you have a Democratic Party that um, has, you know, from uh, summer onward has, has had to take significant stock of Black Lives Matter because of who the anchor groups are in their party. So what's striking, I think, implicit in your question was the notion of you have in time one a certain progressive or dem democratizing action and in time two you have a reaction. And I would suggest that, that we've shrunk in those times, particularly because we have these movement parties now where in real time they're acting and reacting to one another. Like to take if it's okay to take a brief stab at it um so yeah this is something that's hard it's particularly thinking about black movements in the united states right so you have the abolitionist movement which enjoyed a lot of successes changed the constitution with the 13th 14th and 15th amendments uh and then really 20 30 years after this blacks were in a position that was really similar to slavery right so in on paper they had um some rights but in practice that was not the case of course the civil rights movement uh, led to changes, gay black rights in civil, uh, in terms of civil life and in terms of voting rights. Uh, and now we're seeing kind of a pushback and certainly we saw an immediate pushback uh, as the New Deal coalition kind of died out as a result of the of this movement. Um, so I do wonder the same thing, right? We're seeing a rise of Black Lives Matter. We're seeing similar polling support for black social movement that the civil rights movement saw in the 1960s. 
Uh, and then when that ends, what is what happens next, right? Are we going to see a return to where people don't really care about uh, racial issues anymore? I'm somewhat optimistic because I think there have been some pretty big changes to American society, which will lead to, I think, longer standing effects than we saw in the past. The first is demographic change uh, in terms of the number of people of color in the United States. As that group grows, they become more important in terms of in terms of elections. So elected officials can no longer ignore them the way that they could in 1968 or in 1876, uh, where you were incentivized to try to go after people who were, who were more conservative on racial issues. The second is it does seem like there is a real significant change in terms of generation and political values. Uh, millennials and then Generation Z and then beyond that tend to really care more about equality in a way that previous generations didn't. Um, and whether or not this changes as those groups grow older, that's a possibility, but it does seem like some of those changes in political values are stable. And so again, it, it creates a, a situation where politicians who want to build a coalition amongst liberal uh, leaning whites